Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, in the last lecture, we looked at the topological conjugacy classes of linear maps. Right? So, we have the space of linear maps Ax equals Ax, A in R. So, R is the parameter space of the space of linear maps. Right? For each value of A, you get a linear map. And we looked at the topological conjugacy classes. of invertible hyperbolic linear maps. So if you remember, there were four conjugacy classes, minus infinity to 1, uh, to minus 1, minus 1 to 0, 0 to 1, and 1 plus infinity. So we showed that, in fact, any linear map in this set, so any linear map except for a equals 0 or plus or minus 1, are conjugate to each other. But they're not all topologically conjugate. If you want the topologically conjugacy, the, topologically, the topological conjugacy distinguishes, separates, okay, maps that belong to these four regions. So what we, uh, interesting question now, so if you remember the difference between the conjugacy and topological conjugacy, it's just that the conjugacy is a homeomorphism in this case. So question, what about... C1 conjugacy. Can the conjugacy H be a diffeomorphism? In other words, in the same way as when you go from simple conjugacy, in which H is just a bijection, to topological conjugacy, in which H is a homeomorphism, you distinguish more in detail the properties of the system. And so you split it up into four instead of just one conjugacy class. The question is, if you say, if you want this conjugacy to be C1, is that a stronger condition? Obviously, Two maps which belong to different topological conjugacy classes cannot belong to C1 conjugacy classes, right? Because if it's C1 in particular, it's a homeomorphism, so they cannot. So the question is, if you take two maps within the same topological conjugacy class, are they also differentiably conjugate? Or does this create a sm finer division into more C1 conjugacy classes? Okay, this is the question we will address today. Um, so, I will give the answer actually is fairly simple, and I will just give you the answer, uh, which is that indeed, in general, two linear maps, even in the same topological conjugacy class, are not C1 conjugacy, are not C1 conjugate. And uh, the answer is the fo and the reason is the following proposition. I will state it in a little bit more general form. So let F R to R and G R to R be C1 diffeomorphism. which are C1 conjugate. 
So there exists diffeomorphism H R to R such that H composed with F equals G composed with H. Let P, Q be fixed points for F and G respectively, if they exist, if they exist, with H of P equals Q. Then the derivative at P equals the derivative at Q. Uh, so what is this saying? I stated it in one dimension. Actually, this is true in higher dimensions, too. But basically, in one dimension, so this is f from r to r. This is g from r to r. Suppose they are conjugate by C1 diffeomorphism. OK, this is the assumption. Suppose there exists a point here, which is a fixed point which is mapped to fixed point Q by this diffeomorphism. Then what is the statement saying? It's saying that the derivative of P must be equal to the derivative of Q. Okay, so this is the assumption, right? So the assumption is that there exists this diffeomorphism, C1 diffeomorphism. And the conclusion is that if there exist two fixed points that map to each other, then this diffeomorphism may have the same derivative. So what is the implication for our question here? Why is that relevant to this question? Excuse me? Zero is a fixed point. So for all the linear maps, zero is always a fixed point. That's right. So what is the derivative of the fixed point at zero? A. Okay? So each of these maps has a fixed point, right? You can actually draw the graph of these maps, right? X equals AX has a graph. Okay? This is the graph of the map A of X equals AX. It's linear, so the derivative is always A, right? In particular, at the fixed point the derivative is A, okay? So if you take two different linear maps, A of X equals AX and B of X equals BX, can they be differentiably conjugate? Only if A is equal to B. So if A is different from B, they cannot be C1 conjugate because of this proposition. What if A is equal to B? Do we know that they are C1 conjugate? So this just gives a kind of negative, right? This says if this does not hold, then they cannot be C1 conjugate. This is how we use this. So what we're saying is any two linear maps cannot be C1 conjugate unless A is equal to B. What if A is equal to B? 
They're the same map. <laughs> Very good. I thought it, you, you, know, you should get that. So if they're the same map, does that mean that it's conjugate to itself? Is a map conjugate to itself? Yes, but we didn't. I mean, this is a little detail which we should have addressed probably right at the beginning. Sorry? Is a map in general C1 conjugate to itself? Exactly. You take the identity, conjugates the map to itself. The identity is C1 diffeomorphism and it conjugates the, the map to itself. Sorry? That's right. We didn't, uh, yes, we proved it. So it, I guess it's part of the definition. We, in principle, we didn't discuss it explicitly in the class, but we implicitly check that the map is conjugate to itself and we prove that it's an equivalence relation, you're right. Okay? So the consequence of this proposition is that how many C1 conjugacy classes do we have for linear maps? Infinitely, Infinitely many, uncountably many even, right? Uh, every map is its own conjugacy class. So this shows what the comment I made at the beginning is that the difference between conjugacy, topological conjugacy, and C1 conjugacy, right? General conjugacy is a very weak notion of conjugacy. All these linear maps are all conjugate to each other. C1 conjugacy is a very strong definition of conjugacy. None of these maps are conjugate to each other. You don't gain anything. You've not really group them in any way. They're all different conjugacy classes. So you might as well have the original maps. You know, you've not gained anything in this particular setting by taking C1 conjugacy. Topological conjugacy seems to be a very interesting uh, compromise because it groups them in just four classes, so a small, finite number of classes. Each of these classes has some obvious characteristics that they share that seem to be fairly natural. And it seems fairly natural that you don't need to distinguish really be between different maps in here. Okay? So of course, there are certain situations in which you, it's important to know whether maps are C1 conjugate and to discuss that. So I'm not saying this is never relevant. I'm just using this example to really highlight the difference between these three notions of conjugacy. Okay? I think this is a very good example. And we will come back to these three notions in different settings. Yes? The topology on what? So there's two topologies involved here, right? There's the topology on the spaces. So um, a topological conjugacy means that H is a homeomorphism from this space on which one dynamical system is defined. And this is a space on which the other dynamical system is defined. So these are need to be topological spaces for you to be able to say that this is a homeomorphism. right? So implicit in the definition of topological conjugacy is that two systems are conjugate if there's a homeomorphism that conjugates the two dynamics. So in particular, the two spaces on which the dynamics are defined need to be homeomorphic. They need to be homeomorphic topological spaces. I'm not sure if that was your question or not. Yes? Yes? Okay. Okay, so let's prove this. This is really a very simple calculation. I will do it, but I could almost leave it as an exercise. But let's, let's do it. So it's really just an application of the chain rule. So um, proof. Um, so using the conjugacy, we write um, by the definition of conjugacy we have F is equal to 
H minus 1 composed with G composed with H, right? Because H is invertible. In fact, here it's a diffeomorphism, so the inverse is also uh, a C1 diffeomorphism, right? And so by the chain rule, we just differentiate, right? So what is the derivative f prime of x is equal to the derivative of all of this in the point x, right? And you know what the chain rule, how the chain rule works. So this is equal to the derivative of h minus 1 prime in g of h of x, right, times g prime in h of x times h prime in x. Okay, so the chain rule just says that you, you differentiate each map in the point at which it is applied. So now we use the fact that the P is a fixed point. So since P is a fixed point, P is a fixed point, and um, H of P equals Q, then we have that Um, H minus 1, okay, wait, so, so we're applying this at P, okay, so let me write this, F prime of P is equal to H minus 1 prime of G of H of P times G prime H of P times H prime of P. So, um, So this is equal to, so H of P is equal to Q. H of P is equal to Q, right? So this is, uh, this is Q and this is Q. So this is H minus 1 prime in G of Q times G prime in Q times H prime in P. But Q is a fixed point for G also. So this is H minus 1 prime of Q times G prime of Q times H prime of P, okay? And now this H minus 1 prime in H of P is equal to, but, okay, so H minus 1 prime in Q is equal to H minus 1 prime, uh, H minus 1 prime in H of P, Q is H of P in H of P, which is just equal to H prime of P to the minus 1. Okay, this is just the inverse. The derivative of the inverse is 1 over the derivative in the image. Okay, and so this is the inverse of this. Okay, and so this is just equal to G prime of Q. Excuse me? Ah, yes, you're right. You're right. Um, but it cannot be zero because otherwise it would not be a diffeomorphism. Right? If the, 
the definition of diffeomorphism, a diffeomorphism cannot have zero derivative at the fixed point because otherwise the inverse would have infinite derivative at that fixed point, which is not acceptable. Right? If the, if the diffeomorphism at a fixed point has zero, in fact, not just at the fixed point, at any point, it cannot have zero derivative anywhere because otherwise the inverse would have infinite derivative. Okay, so diffeomorphism cannot have zero derivative. Thank you, that's a good point. Though. Okay, so this is just a simple calculation that shows this. Okay, so this is... Uh, completes our discussion of the different kinds of conjugacies. So now, to wrap up this section on linear maps, we want to use, apply all these ideas of conjugacies to study the structural stability. So if you remember, at the beginning I said one of the most interesting applications of this idea of the, this kind of equivalence class is to talk about structural stability. for one-dimensional linear maps. So do you remember what structural stability means? Anyone? In the same conjugacy class, that's right. So structural stability is the following. I take a, a system and I say, what happens if I make a small perturbation of the system? Does it change the conjugacy class or not? Does the system change or not? Okay? So there's two crucial ingredients that are required to formulate this. One is what do we mean by changing the system a little bit? And the second, what do we mean by the system stays the same? Right? So, in other words, let... Ax equals Ax, okay, does, does the dynamics change under small perturbations? So there's two notions that are involved here. Two notions. What do we mean by one does the system change? And two, what do we mean by small perturbation. So what do we mean? In this case, it's particularly clear. So what do we mean by does the system change? Means is the new system conjugate to the original one? Okay? And as we have seen, there's various ways to define, you know, there's various conditions we can use to say they're conjugate. So depending on whether we use a simple conjugacy or differentiable conjugacy or topological conjugacy, we will get a different answer as to whether the systems are the same or not. Okay? And the second is what do we mean by small perturbation? In this case, it is fairly natural. There's an obvious topology on the space of linear maps. What is the topology? What is the space of linear maps? Here. The space of one dimensional linear maps is just given by the parameter A. Right? So there is an obvious way to say what it means for two linear maps to be close is just A and B should be close. Right? So a small perturbation means a small neighborhood of A. That is a small perturbation. So in this particular setting, the question is. To formulate the question more precisely in this, so given 
A in R does there exists does there exist a neighborhood um, let's call it U of A such that for all B in U A of X equals AX and B of X equals BX are say topologically or C1 conjugate. This is the notion of structural stability. So I take R, this is, I take it as the parameter space of linear maps. This is zero, this is one, this is minus one. So my question is this, I take a parameter A, and I say, is the linear map AX equals AX structurally stable? What is the answer? Is it structurally stable for this parameter value A? It is? So can I find a neighborhood of A such that all the maps in here are all conjugate to A? Yeah? yeah? Does it depend on where I chose the point A or is it true for every A? Sorry? Minus one and one. For minus one and one what? Yeah. Then what? Then, uh, it then it will be stable. If it's between minus one and one. And what about here if it's bigger than one? Is this actually stable? Also. Let's make sure that everyone is on board here. Annie, do you know where we are? Is the question clear? What about the answer? So what do we know about whether two parameters A and B like this are conjugate or not? Mariam? That's your name, right? What do you think? Are these two maps corresponding to these two parameters, are they conjugate? A of x equals AX, B of x equals BX. Are these two conjugate? Do you know? <laughs> Was that a kind of, okay, 50-50 <laughs> chance? <laughs> Why are they conjugate? That's the definition of conjugate. <laughs> but why do they belong to the same conjugacy class? Did we show that? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. And so? To the same conjugacy class. What kind of conjugacy? Topological conjugacy, C1 conjugacy? Topological conjugacy. What if I'm interested in a C1 conjugacy? Are A and B conjugate? Exactly. So if I'm interested in the C1 conjugacy, 
does that exist a neighborhood of A such that all the parameters in here are conjugate to A under the C1 conjugacy? No. So is A structurally stable under C1 conjugacy? It's not structurally stable. Structurally stable means you change a little bit and things do not change according to the conjugacy you have chosen. Okay? So the notion of structural stability depends on which notion of conjugacy you have used. Okay? If you choose topological conjugacy, then all these points, as you said, except for 0, minus 1, and 1, they're all structurally stable. Because if you take any point, because remember, these are exactly the topological conjugacy classes, are exactly these, right? This is one topological conjugacy class. Can use different colors. This is another topological conjugacy class. This is another topological conjugacy class. And this also isn't. There's four topological conjugacy classes. They're open in the standard topology on the real line. Okay, which means that if you choose any point inside here, you can find a neighborhood. Any point, however close to zero you are, you can find a small neighborhood that remains inside the same conjugacy class. So every invertible hyperbolic linear map is structurally stable with respect to topological conjugacy. Don't, don't zero, one, one. Exactly. When I say invertible and hyperbolic, I use to, to, to exactly to exclude those cases. What about 0 and minus 1 and 1? Are they structurally stable, this map at minus 1? Is it structurally stable? There is a map at minus 1. A of x equals minus x. It's a perfectly well-defined map. No, it's not, but it's still a linear map. So my question is, is that structurally stable? Exactly. And remember, we, we know that for minus 1, for example, every point is periodic of period 2. When you take a small perturbation, you get maps that have only one single fixed point at 0 and no other periodic points. So this map at minus 1 cannot be even conjugate. Not even, we don't even need topological conjugate. It just cannot even be just conjugate to any of the maps that have arbitrarily close to it. Okay? So the uh, points minus 1, 0, and 1 are not structurally stable in any sense whatsoever. Because if you make a small perturbation, you will get something that is not even conjugate to the original map. But if you take anything outside these three points, then they will be structurally stable with respect to topological conjugacy, but not structurally stable with respect to C1 conjugacy, because no map is structurally stable with respect to C1 conjugacy. Because with respect to C1 conjugacy, every map, every arbitrarily small perturbation will give you a map that is in a different C1 conjugacy class because the only C1 conjugacy classes are just individual points. Okay. So maybe let me summarize this. So proposition. Um, every invertible hyperbolic linear map is, um, is structurally stable with respect to topological conjugacy. But no map, but every linear map is structurally unstable with respect to C1 
structurally stable with respect to topological conjugates, structurally unstable with respect to similar conjugates. Okay, I'm not going to write down the formal proof because we've discussed it, it's pretty clear, but you need to make sure that you understand how to prove this, okay? This could be a, this is a good candidate for an exam question, all right? I'm saying it's a good candidate, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it collects the results we've been doing until now. It, uh, it, uh, it, it, it tests understanding of the concepts that we're talking about and the specific results that we've done until now, that we've discussed until now. Complex parameters. Uh, yes, you'd have to, we have, depending on the uh, family of dynamical systems that we have, we will have different topologies on the space of dynamical systems. Right? So, in certain situations, there are certain families of maps which are naturally parameterized by the complex numbers. In other families, as we shall see in fact now, we will talk about nonlinear maps and we don't really have a parameter space, but we have a topology on the space of all maps, like the C0 topology or the C1 topology. I will talk about it either today or tomorrow. I don't know if you have, have you done these topologies on the space of continuous maps or C1 maps, no? Okay, I will introduce them. But that's right, so implicit in this is because we're looking at some very simple examples, then the, and, the, and the family of all one-dimensional linear maps is parameterized by the real line, then the most obvious topology on the space of linear maps is just the standard Euclidean topology on the real line. But of course, this depends on the topology we choose on the real line, notion of, because the notion of neighborhood depends on the topology, okay? So what you want is a neighborhood such that everything in there is, is conjugate to each, uh, all the maps in this neighborhood are conjugate to each other. We will see many examples of this kind. Okay. Okay. Yes. So we we seen that in the four cases. Yes. But also other standard topology, you know, like open interval down the mean. Yes. How does that um is it done under in some way? Try to formulate your question a little bit better. So you see, these, the conjugacy classes, each conjugacy class is an open interval. One, two, three, four conjugacy classes. So if a conjugacy class is open, then automatically any element in that conjugacy class is structurally stable. Because by definition of open, any element in there will have a neighborhood that's contained in that conjugacy class. Okay? So in this case, this is another way to see this, is that if the conjugacy classes are open, clearly every element in, these, in one of these conjugacy classes is open. In general, this is not necessarily the case. You might have conjugacy class that has a, a boundary. In this case, the boundaries of the conjugacy classes do not belong to that conjugacy class. But you might have some situations in which the boundary belongs to that conjugacy class, but it's still the boundary. So it means that the boundary belongs to the conjugacy class, for example, on the left, but not the one on the right. You might have situations like that. So if you're in the interior of your conjugacy class, you're structurally stable. If you're on the boundary, you're not. This is another way, equivalent way, to think about structural stability. So is your map in the interior of its conjugacy class? And to define that, you need a topology on the space of system to talk about being in the, in the interior of your conjugacy class. You need a topology that tells you what it means to be in the interior of your conjugacy class of maps. Okay? And we will see several examples now. Okay, I think maybe this is a moment just to take a very quick two-minute break and, and have a glass of water. Okay, so now we are going to remain in a one-dimensional setting because it's simpler setting to illustrate some concepts, but we're going to take the step beyond linear maps to nonlinear maps. 
where you don't have such a simple and obvious parameter space of families. So we're going to now consider interval, study interval diffeomorphism. So we suppose I is a compact interval, I in R is a compact interval. So generally, you can just think of I equals 0, 1, for example. But it really doesn't matter. Everything will. Sorry? I... Yes, yes. So it doesn't really matter. We will study the, the, the dynamics of maps on compact intervals. Okay, so if you have a map on one compact interval, just up to the scaling is the same as any map on any other compact interval. It doesn't make a difference. And we take f from i to i, a diffeomorphism, C1 diffeomorphism. So this is interval i, interval i. This is just a map from i to i. Remember, diffeomorphism in particular needs to be a bijection. So in general, the diffeomorphism will look something like this. The map will look something like this. So just a few observations about interval diffeomorphisms. Um, first of all, notice that the endpoints are mapped to the endpoints. So end, end points are mapped to end points. Also, um, since it's a diffeomorphism, by the same reason we said before, we have that f prime is not equal to 0 for all x in i because otherwise the inverse would have infinite derivative and that cannot be, it's not part of, it's in the definition of C1 diffeomorphism that that cannot happen. Um, and so this means that either, so either f prime of x is greater than zero for all x in i, or f prime of x is less than zero for all x in i. So you can only really have one of these two cases. In this case, we call it orientation preserving. And in this case, we call the map orientation reversing. If a map is orientation reversing, then the iterate of that map is the second iterate of that map is orientation preserving. So, in some sense, the orientation reversing uh, maps are kind of uh, special, and there's a very simple classification of these, and I'm going to leave this as an exercise. So, the orientation reversing. Uh, Dynamics of orientation reversing maps is fairly simple. There's not much that can happen. Okay, we leave that as an exercise. Whereas for orientation preserving, there's a much richer structure. So from now on, we're going to study always the orientation preserving case. Okay, all the iterates are always orientation preserving, so it's a kind of a closed class of system. Um, what do we want to say about orientation preserving maps? So if, if P is a fixed point, if F of P is equal to P, we say P is hyperbolic fixed point if F prime of P is not equal to 1. 
which is completely consistent with the linear case, right? We do not include the, the minus one here because we're assuming that we're orientation preserving, so the derivative is just zero. The, the derivative is positive. So if all fixed points, if all fixed points of F are hyperbolic, then we say that F is hyperbolic. So, what is the dynamics of interval diffeomorphism? So, we start with the following proposition. F i to i, orientation preserving, C1 interval diffeomorphism. Then, for all x in i, the limit sets omega x and alpha x, the alpha and omega limit sets, are fixed points. for F. Shall I prove it or leave it as an exercise? I will sketch the proof. It's a fairly simple exercise, actually. But the conclusions are non-trivial. The conclusions are fundamental to the theory of interval diffeomorphism and show also that interval diffeomorphism have a particularly simple kind of dynamics. Like, so here, we're starting with simple systems where not much can happen. And then we will go and we will see that the systems with this very complicated omega limits. Okay, so basically what this says is that the only thing that a point can do, if you choose a point X and you iterate it, it must converge to a fixed point, both in forward time and in backward time. That's what that says. So it cannot do strange things. It must converge to a fixed point. Okay, and that basically follows from the fact that this map is monotone, mono, monotone, monotonically increasing. And so the sequence of points along the orbit is monotone increasing or monotone decreasing. And a monotone increasing sequence must converge to some point. And the only thing that really needs to check is that that point is a fixed point for F. Okay? So I will just sketch briefly the proof here, but it's very simple. So let x in i, okay? If x is a fixed point, then what? Then there's nothing to prove. Then it's obvious, right? Because for a fixed point, the omega limit set of a fixed point is itself, and the alpha limit set is also itself, if it's an invertible map, right? So if f of x happens to be already a fixed point, then this is clear, okay? Then alpha limit of x equals the fixed point itself, which is equal to omega limit, okay? And nothing to prove. Uh, well, and that's the proof. Okay, that's fine. So suppose, so if f 
of x is different from x, then either um, f of x is greater than x or f of x is less than x. Those are the only two possibilities. If f of x is greater than x, then f of x minus x is greater than 0. By the way, what do these possibilities correspond to uh, geometrically? It's always useful, especially in these one-dimensional maps, you can gain a lot of intuition from looking at the graph of a map, right? So every diffeomorphism of the interval, orientation preserving, basically looks like this. The derivative is positive. It has to map endpoints to endpoints, which means that the endpoint, if this is the interval AB or 0, 1, it must map A to A and B to B. In the orientation reversing case, A would map to B and B would map to A. So it would go like this. Right? But in the orient it still has to map endpoints to endpoints. In the orientation preserving cases like this, A maps to A, B maps to B. The derivative has to be bigger than 0 everywhere, and so it has to do something like this. It can be like this, or it doesn't have to intersect the diagonal, of course. It could be just something like this. It could also be something like this. Okay. In fact, basically, these are the three kinds that, that we will consider. In, this in these two cases, these are the only two fixed points. right? Because remember that a fixed point, okay, crucial observation. When you look at the graph of an interval map, a point is fixed if and only if the graph intersects the diagonal. This is clear, right? Because the diagonal is the line where y equals x, so it's a fixed point precisely means that f of x equals x if the graph intersects the diagonal. So you can immediately see from the graph where the fixed points are. Okay? Here it intersects the diagonal, and here it intersects the diagonal. These are fixed points. It could be that these are the only two fixed points. For example, if you have this situation or this situation, or it could be that you have several fixed points. Okay? Um, it could also be that you have an infinite number of fixed points. What is an example of a interval diffeomorphism with an infinite number of fixed points. Identity. What? Identity. Okay, of course. Not, not of course. The identity is the best <laughs> counterexample in so many situations. Okay? Don't always try with the identity first. <laughs> Whenever you're looking for some ex counterexample or something, try the identity, okay? Because otherwise you start constructing very complicated construction where the identity works, okay? The identity works, or you can have just something that is the identity in some piece. Like, what does the identity? The identity means that it exactly coincides with the diagonal. That gives you an infinite number of fixed points. So you can try to construct something that oscillates lots, or you can just construct something that goes along the diagonal for a certain, you know, certain piece, and that gives you an infinite number of fixed points. That is the identity even just on some piece. Okay? So in this case, is the map hyperbolic? What is the derivative at these fixed points? One. One. So the map is not hyperbolic. These fixed points are not hyperbolic, and the map is not hyperbolic. Okay? So I'm just anticipating one of the reasons to introduce this definition of hyperbolicity in this case, just as in the linear case, is to exclude certain very unpleasant situations like this one. Okay? In fact, we will see that if this map, if all the fixed points are hyperbolic, there can only be a finite number of fixed points. Because if the fixed point is hyperbolic, then it must cross and it cannot be accumulated by other fixed points. So it needs to be just a finite number. Okay, but that was just a little parenthesis. This is just to give some idea. So what does it mean here that f of x is bigger than x in the graph? For example, let's look at just this. this uh, okay, look at this graph here. Okay, for this point. What is it? 
and this is x and this is f of x. Is f of x bigger than x or smaller than x? Bigger than x. How can you tell? Because the graph is above the diagonal. Right? So you can immediately tell for each point if you look at the graph whether f of x is less than x or bigger than x. Right? So if instead you were looking at the pink curve, you take this point x here, and then f of x is here. And because it's below the diagonal, this means that f of x is less than x. Okay? So here you can see exactly this situation that we described here, that either x is already a fixed point, or if it's not a fixed point, clearly it must be either below the diagonal, the graph must be either below the diagonal or above the diagonal, which corresponds to those two cases that we saw before. Okay? So we suppose that, let's suppose, in fact, the two cases are exactly the same. So just for definiteness, suppose we take this case, what does this mean? It means that f of x minus x is greater than 0. So, for example, it could be, let me, let's uh, just stick to one map, maybe. So this is the diagonal. Let's suppose the map looks something like this. So let's suppose we take a point x here where the graph is above the diagonal, OK? So what's going to happen to the next iterates? Can we say something about what happens to the next iterate? Well, where is this point here in your dynamics, in your dynamical space? So this is the dynamical space, A, B. This is why initial condition x0. And this here is x1, the image. Where will x2 be? What's the image of x1? Excuse me? That's right. That's right. And how do we see? Is that a graphical representation? So we're going to do it in two ways. I'm going to, we're going to write down formally what we know, but I think it's also very useful to understand how to look at it in the picture. Exactly. So you want to know, you want to look at, find out where x1 is here, because when you know where x1 is here, then you can look at its image by looking at the graph. Okay? So how do you carry x1 from the vertical axis to the horizontal axis? You just reflect it in the, in the diagonal. Right? So geometrically, you look at x1, and then you take a horizontal line all the way to the diagonal. And then you take it down like this. And this will be x1. This is exactly x1. Yeah. Okay. And then you can look at the graph. And you say, OK, what's the image of x1? Well, the image of x1 is here. Right? So x2 will be somewhere here. But having x2 on the vertical axis is not much good for us. What we want to know is where x2 on the horizontal axis. So we can do the same thing. We take x2, and I don't need, what's the point of me starting from this point, going all the way to the left, and then going back all the way to the right? Just from here, I can just go directly down to the diagonal. And what's the point of me now coming all the way down and then going all the way up again? I can just start from this point, and I can go up again. So let me just draw a picture of what we're doing. OK, I'm just taking a little parenthesis to show you how you can analyze this graphically. So let me zoom in to this region here. So here I have the map looks like this. right? And what am I doing? I start somewhere under here, OK? And I end up with this point here which is this point here, right? And then what I did is I said, OK, this is x1. Now you come back, and you reflect in the diagonal, and then you go down. Reflecting in the diagonal means finding this point here. And then I go down to x1, but then what do I use x1 for? I just use it to find the next image, which will be this point on the graph here, which is this point here, OK? And now this, 
corresponds to x2. Okay, so I take x2, and then I go back and I reflect it in the diagonal, which means I move to the diagonal here. Then in principle, I go down and I, found I, I find x3 down here, and then I look for the next image. I come back up and go across to the graph again. So really, the iterates of the map, you can just kind of graphically draw a picture like this, which shows you that this point is moving okay, from here to here to here, wherever these images are from here, from here to here. And it is converging to this end point. So this is a very useful graphical analysis. It does not prove anything because it's just a picture, but it helps you to get a feeling for what is going on. So because the graph is always above the diagonal, then the image, the next image is always bigger than the point that came before. Okay? And so you have a monotone increasing sequence. Okay? So repeating... Um, Repeating this argument, so uh, let's write f of let's write this as x one minus x zero greater than zero. Repeating this argument, we get x two greater than x one. Okay, and uh, so the orbit xn n in n, which is equal to fn of x0, sorry, n in n, n in n, is monotone increasing, is monotone Increasing. In forward time. So what can you say about a monotone increasing sequence of points on the real line? This is a so sequence of points. This is monotone increasing. It's also bounded, that's right. It's bounded, therefore it converges. That's what we're interested in here. We're in a compact interval. Therefore, this is an increasing sequence. So every monotone increasing sequence xn, which is bounded, converges to some p in i. Okay, it's monotone increasing in bound. So xn converges to p as n tends to plus infinity. which is what we're seeing in this picture. Because you're just increasing, you're increasing, increasing. There's no thing else that you can do except converge. Either you go to infinity or you converge to something. What is left? We need to show that this point P is a fixed point. We need to show that it doesn't converge to something. Since we know that this is the only fixed point, we need to show that it actually reaches the fixed point because it's monotone increasing, but maybe it converges to some other point here that comes before the fixed point. Okay, we just need to check that. We need to show that it converges and it comes all the way here. So we need to show that f of p equals p. Sorry? Why by construction? Why by construction? 
as a diagonal. Yes. And as a image. That's right. And why might that not be the case? Yes, so I mean your observations are correct. So it's almost trivial, but it's not completely. We're using so you're saying it converges to the it converges to p, and now you need to show that the fact that it converges to p implies that f of p equals p. Is the upper bound, and so. So in this particular case, p is the end point of the interval. But how do we know it does not stop here? Somewhere before that. Because we say that f of x is bigger, is bigger than f of x, but we don't know that f of p is bigger than p. Is is I mean. F of x n. But some sequence of x n. F of x n is a subsequence of x n, and so. By the continuity of f. By the continuity of f. Okay. This is what implicitly you were using this fact, but this is a crucial ingredient here. Okay, you need to use the continuity of f, exactly. So how do we write this out? So the continuity of f is, is plays the crucial role here. So what we have is that f of x n, so by continuity of f, we have that f of x n converges to f of p, just by continuity. Okay, but f of x n has the same limit as f of x n. But f of x n equals x n plus one, and so the sequences, and so the limit of as n tends to infinity of x n is the same as the limit as n tends to infinity of x n plus one which is the same as the limit as 10 tends to infinity of f of xn. Okay? And the limit here is p, and the limit here is f of p. It's just continuity. Okay. Okay? So... The intuition is completely correct, but the formally depends on the continuity of the map F. Okay, so this allows us to study the conjugacy classes of these maps, because this is, of course, our goal. We want to classify all these interval diffeomorphisms, and classification means understanding when are two interval diffeomorphisms conjugate. So what do you think? Let's see. Let's start with the simplest cases. So, um, okay, conjugacy classes. Um, so first of all, just heuristically, of course, what this proposition says is that the fixed point play a crucial role because if a, a diffeomorphism has a certain number of fixed points, every other point ends up in one of these fixed points, right? So the, the fixed points determine the, the long-term asymptotic dynamics of every orbit, right? Because every orbit in backward time and in forward time ends up in a fixed point. So the fixed point play a crucial role in classifying these systems, and we will see this more specifically. So let's start by looking at two maps that have, that both have just two fixed points. So let F I to I and G J to J um, C1 orientation preserving diffeomorphisms. Suppose both F and G 
have only two fixed points. So So what does it mean that I have two fixed points? Because we saw that the end points are always fixed, then it means that one is like this, and the other one maybe is also like this. Okay, F and G. Notice they do not need to be defined on the same interval. So are these going to be conjugate, topologically conjugate, differentiably conjugate? Do they look conjugate to you? Could they be conjugate? Yeah, it's for topology. Topologically conjugate. Makes sense that they're topologically conjugate? Why would you say? How would you convince me without a formal proof? The intervals are homeomorphic as intervals, but now the conjugacy needs to conjugate the dynamics as well, right? It's not enough for the spaces to be homeomorphic. The homeomorphism needs to conjugate the dynamics, right? So we need a homeomorphism that maps H composed with F equals G composed with H. So we need to map orbits to orbits. So you would clearly naturally map these two fixed points to the corresponding fixed points. And then can you have a homeomorphism that maps every orbit here to every orbit here. Every orbit must tend towards this point. So we have just two fixed points, so every two corresponding points there have the same omega limit and the same alpha limits. That's right. So what are the alpha and omega limits of points in here? Is there zero point? And which one is it in this case? Why do you think? Who can be more sure? It, 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 it's, <laughs> it's over, it's above the diagonal. Yeah, it's obvious. You don't need to think. It's obvious. Yeah, By the argument we just did, you take a point x here, its image is above the diagonal, so it increases. Right? This image is above the diagonal, so you think this. So all the points are moving to the right. Yeah. And therefore they converge to this end point here. And the alpha limit is, is, is this end point here. And the same for this. Right? All these points are moving to here, and all the points are moving to here. Okay, so the gut feeling is that this should be topologically conjugate because you think, okay, you know, it's not exactly the same. I mean, you think that, that you should be able to take all the points that are all doing very similar things, a little bit like in the linear case when everything was going to zero, you think they should be topologically conjugate, and this is correct, of course. Okay, we will construct the conjugacy here. Yeah. Um, what about if this case here is, is doing this? Are these still topologically conjugate? It doesn't preserve omega limits or alpha limits. Why not? Here, the omega limit is over at least zero. Why do you keep thinking instead of being sure? <laughs> Yes. And so? It does not preserve the omega limits and also the alpha limits. What does not preserve? What does not preserve the omega limits? Oh. This homeomorphism. Yeah. So you're saying correctly that if this homeomorphism maps x to a point y, then it needs to map the omega limit of x to the omega limit of y. Right? So why does it not do that? Well, you say, well, the omega limit of x is this point, and the omega limit of y is this point. 
So why can H not map this point to that point? Yeah. Sorry, this point to this point. Can it? Can it? But can you have a homeomorphism that maps this interval to this interval, that maps this point to this point and this point to that point, that flips the interval? Of course you can have a homeomorphism that does that. It's an orientation reversing homeomorphism because it switches the order, but it's not a problem. You just switch the order. Right? That's still a homeomorphism. It's not part of the definition of the conjugacy. There's no particular requirements on orientation. In, in general, between two topological spaces, you don't even have the, the notion of orientation. So it's just a homeomorphism between these, these two as topological spaces. And there's no reason in this case why it cannot switch them around in which case it should be, we should need to check, we need to prove this, but there's no reason a priori why we couldn't imagine that these two are also topologically conjugate, okay? Although we need to prove, we need to check that. But, um, okay, so keep this in mind. So we don't have much time left, so I don't think I will be able to finish the proof here. Um, Okay, so let me postpone the construction to the next lecture, but let me first say um, that we're going to use the same construction as we did for linear cases. We're going to use fundamental domains. Right? So it would be a very good exercise if you want to try to do it at home. It's very easy. In the same way, because every point here is moving from here to here, for every point, the alpha limit is this and the omega limit is this. So you should be able to find a small interval here, which is a fundamental domain, exactly in the same way as the linear case. So any point in, few, in backward time will go here, in forward time will go here, and it should spend just one iterate inside this fundamental domain. And then another fundamental domain here in the same way, and then you map by a homeomorphism the two fundamental domains, and you extend it exactly like we did for linear case, and we construct this topological conjugacy. We check that it's what we get is a homeomorphism, and we construct a topological conjugacy. Okay? So I will do some, or at least I will sketch some part of the construction. But it is exactly the same as we did for the linear case, except for you don't have an explicit form. When you need to explain why this is a fundamental domain, it's not just multiplication by A or B. You need a slightly more sophisticated argument to show that that's a fundamental domain. That's the only difference. Excuse me? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, it does work. Yeah, the definition is the same. It's just to show that, well, the argument is almost exactly the same, yeah. Just to show that you cannot jump. So here you take some x tilde. Here you take f of x tilde. This is your fundamental domain, closed on one side, open on the other side, and everything is exactly the same, just to show that you cannot jump, and that if you jump, you land only once. Well, it's basically exactly the same. I mean, when we did it for the linear case, we used a little bit the fact that it was exactly multiplication by A, but, you know, it's, it's almost exactly the same argument. So since we just have a couple of minutes, let me say first, what about C1 conjugacy? Assuming we can prove that these are topological conjugate, what about C1 conjugate? Are they C1 conjugate? Exactly. So certainly, if the derivative at these two fixed points is different, then they cannot be C1 conjugate. So for this to add, does not work exactly. In particular, in this case, it does not work. So this is another example of how strong the C1 conjugacy is, right? So two maps, even if they look very similar, even if the, so if this map is like this, okay? Even if it's, even if the two maps coincide, 
almost at every point, but at the fixed point, they're a little bit different. The derivatives are different. The maps cannot be C1 conjugate. Okay, just to show how strong it is. So we shall see that in the space, we still need to put a topology on the space of interval diffeomorphism. But instinctively, you can see that say, if we will show that all the maps that look like this basically are, are topologically conjugate, then you will have a reasonable large conjugacy class which contains a lot of maps. And it is also reasonable in the sense that these maps all, all have pretty much the same behavior, all the points map to one of these two fixed points. On the other hand, differentiable conjugacy, you can still have two maps that are different, but in the same differentiable conjugacy class, right? So this is different from the linear case. So in these two cases, we will not prove it, but you can prove that if they, are, if they do have the same derivative, then you can construct a differentiable conjugacy between here. So you can have maps that are different, but are in the same differentiable conjugacy class. But you can also have two maps that just differ a little bit in the different differentiable conjugacy class. OK. So again, the topological conjugacy class seems like a more natural and robust definition of equivalence. OK. So in the next lecture, we will do this construction. We will also look at maps with several periodic points, okay? although that, again, will be almost the same. And then we will define the topology on the space of this interval diffeomorphism that allows us to address the notion of structural stability. Okay. Thank you.